My guest today is Ted Neward. Ted, how are you, my friend? Oh, I'm doing well, Dave. I uh, gotta say, I miss you. I miss seeing you at conferences. Uh, I miss seeing you. Uh, I miss uh, the hugs, man. I know. I know. Um, I watched your uh, um, 100 episode summary of Technology and Friends, and there are a lot of familiar faces there, man. Yeah. That's 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 pretty impressive. All the episodes you've done over the years. Yeah, good good guests make for a good show. That's no question about that. And uh, I used to back in the day, <laughs> like a year ago, I I used to swear up and down that I would always do these interviews in person. I would never <laughs> do them remotely over t- tools like Zoom or Teams. And and then 2020 hit, and I had to make a choice, and I chose yeah. to yeah. Well, connect, connect remotely is better than not connecting at all. We, you know, a year ago, we all of us faced some hard choices, right? You know, everybody worldwide. And, um, you know, we, we, we did what, what, what we would always do in that situation, which is to quote Jurassic Park and say, life <laughs> finds a way and keep going. Life, uh, finds a way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, uh, so you and I, we you know, we know each other through the tech, the tech community. You know, we've met yep. at these conferences many times, and uh, we've attended, we've been driven to conferences together, and um, uh, and we we sort of have been uh, taking advantage of, and in some ways helping to build that sense of community out in the broad tech community. And I understand you're doing something similar with in your current role at Quicken Loans. Right. So um, actually, it's coming up on a year now. Um, my, uh, my leader, Brian Woodring, who is the CIO at Quicken Loans, approached me and said, you know, Ted, in your current role, which was building out some platform strategy, you're, you're getting involved in a number of things that really have nothing to do with platform strategy. You know, you've been very interested in, in interviewing. You've been very interested in how do we do mentoring. You've been very interested in a lot of these kinds of things, which is very true. I mean, it was, it was something that I was, um, very much involved in when I was running DevRel over at Smartsheet, and even before that, when I was CTO of the startup consulting company. Yeah, um, and even, even outside of your jobs, this is oh, yeah. clearly, you have a, clearly you have a passion for teaching and mentoring folks. Oh yeah, I mean, the teaching runs in my blood. My mother was a teacher, most of her siblings were involved in education, half of my father's siblings were in education. Uh, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's, it's, the idea of you know always be training, the idea of always be teaching people something or always be learning something. It's just I you know it's it's kind of part of the blood. I've never really known a part of time in my life where I wasn't actively reading or something like that. And frankly, um, over the years, it just became really apparent to me that we in the industry were not doing a great job. Um, you know, you can blame it wherever you'd like. I know certain people will say that, you know, it's up to the individual. We all have to be craftsmen uh, or craftspeople or whatever they're whatever they're trying to rebrand themselves as now. But when you look at what other industries do, when you look at how other industries approach this, they actually put some structural support behind it, right? I mean, doctors are expected as part of their professional activities to be reading the New England Journal of Medicine and to be, you know, you know, meeting with other doctors and to be teaching and training and, you know, and, and, you know, uh, mentoring the next generation of uh, attendants. Yeah, they call uh, that professional development in industry. Exactly, exactly. And it's not something that they do just on their own, right? We don't expect doctors to like go grab bodies out of a graveyard and practice surgery with cadavers. You know, this is actually a formal part (laughs) of their day job. It's got I, really dark, really fast. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you, when, you, when you start thinking about it, um, we, you know, there's so many industries where we do, we where we do actually expect that practice is a part of the profession. But then you get to technology where it's like, oh, well, if you don't have GitHub projects that you're doing on your own time, you're doing it wrong. And it's like, no, 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 we need to do better about this. Okay. And so, yeah. 
it's always been, um, I shouldn't say always, for at least the last 10 years, it's been a thing that I've really, really been, uh, you know, seeing more, focusing more, understanding more uh, technology wide that we, we as an industry need to get better. So he was definitely tapping into where some of my interests and professional passion lay. And I said, so where are you going with this, Brian? And he said, well, I'm not paying you to do these things. What happens when I pay you to do these things? And I said, huh, challenge accepted. Let's go do yeah. that. So we formed a team in March called Technology Culture inside of Quicken Loans. And realistically speaking, when we, when we classically talk about, you know, software development departments and the various things that make up an effective technology company, we talk about people, process, and technology. And um, lots of companies spend a lot of time thinking about the, the technology and the process. We, tech, in tech culture, we focus on the people. Um, everything about the people, uh, everything, you know, how do we make them better? How do we listen to them better? How do we, you know, anything you can imagine around people in a technology company, that's what we focus on. Uh, what specifically are you doing to focus on people? Um, well, a lot of the things we already mentioned, right? So, for example, um, one of the first things we wanted to do is go and look at some of the interview processes. Um, part of this was also, you know, it's also in line with a lot of the diversity and inclusion effort that Quicken Loans committed to as, you know, both, you know, we, we had committed to it before the George Floyd protests, but the George Floyd protests over the summer really, really just elevated how important that was. The Black Lives Matter movement really has uh, elevated to, you know, to our consciousness that this is a thing that we can't just expect to correct itself. We have to actively work, look for ways. And one of the things, for example, that we wanted to do is start ensuring that none of our interviews have implicit bias within them or unconscious bias. But more importantly, that when we are interviewing somebody, we're we're not just we're not just looking at this individual and saying, you know, uh, are you solving the problem the way I want it to be solved? We're not just going and doing the canonical whiteboard. Uh, I mean, that that's that's to me everything that's wrong with the technology industry in a nutshell is exemplified by the canonical whiteboard interview, right? right. Walk over to the whiteboard and code for me in pseudocode how you would do a you know a, a red black tree implementation. Oh, okay. box arrow, box arrow, cylinder. <laughs> I learned that from you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, seriously, right? When's the last time that anybody actually wrote their own red black tree from scratch? So the problem course, is, yeah, it's, silly, not, a, it's right? not a practical you, skill to have. If I, I, I cannot, and it hasn't hurt me that I cannot. Exactly, and frankly. The number of people for whom that will be a necessary skill is a very, very small percentage. I mean, I guess, I, I, I submit that it's in the single digits percentage wise of people who really need to be able to look at an algorithm and write the algorithm, tweak the algorithm, et cetera. Most of us are not in the position of writing highly optimized database query engines or highly optimized uh, uh, game iteration engines yeah. or, you know. Right. We want to be able to use those tools because they already exist. Exactly. So, the, you know, the, the meat of the question is already a name. Secondly, go do it at a whiteboard where you don't have any of the classic tools that you would use as a developer. Like I mean, Google. just, well, Stack Overflow. <laughs> or Stack right? Overflow, right? Let's just call that spade a spade, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you're now taking this, you're, you're taking this, fish out of water right and asking them to climb a tree and <laughs> the tree is actually irrelevant to anything the fish would be doing in the water right right and just to make it a hat trick do this in front of a half a dozen people who will just sit there and stare no, at you no pressure <laughs> and Microsoft actually was a participant in a study with I think it was University of North Carolina where they showed that it, just the mere act of doing it in front of participants, right? Let's keep the whiteboard in. Let's keep the whiteboard and keep the question, but just leaving the interview candidate in the room by themselves, as opposed to being stared at by people while they're working it out, 
mm. went from a 50% success rate to a 100% success rate. Interesting. Right. And so, I mean, just everything about that canonical interview process is broken, right? Now, fortunately, QL was not that bad, but there were still an, uh, a number of inches, as we say internally, there were a number of inches to be gained by looking at that process and improving it and looking for some tools to try to improve that and help get it to a point where we're focused on what you would actually be doing on the job as opposed to can you can you recite computer science arcana right and that's one of the things that we're looking at um we've had some informal mentoring programs inside the company that have spun up and then fizzled out because they didn't have anybody who was dedicated full time to supporting that mm. so i hired somebody recently elsewhere from within the company to come and focus on building that um ah. you know, she's a she's a technology team leader so she's lived it uh, both, you know, as somebody who's written code and has led people who have written code. And so she's, you know, that's literally what we're paying her to do is figure out how we're going to spin up a mentoring program across the 2000 people in rocket technology and just also hired somebody to focus on our onboarding. Um, you know, I know at uh, many of the startups in the technology space, you start on your first day and you open your your bright shiny Macintosh and all of the stuff you need is already installed there. And that's a, that's a win. That's also kind of the ante to play now if you wanna be a technology company. And so we want to, you know, rather than, um, I mean, we did a great job of getting the hardware in front of people. You know, now for the most part, by the time you start on your first day, you've already received your laptop, you've already received your two monitors, your keyboard, your webcam, et cetera. Just, physical, that's, uh, that's unusual, by the way. <laughs> Most jobs I've started that did not get that on day one or even day 10. And and this is where I'm going to give major props to our, um, our support team, our technology support team inside of QL. We call them the guy, right? <laughs> you know, so you just call the guy if you got a, you know, I got a guy, you just call the guy. That's where it came from. We really fond of these pithy names. <laughs> um, the guy did an amazing job in the span of a week to um, not just for the 2,000 people in technology, but for all 30,000 across all of Dan Gilbert's family of companies, right. um, getting hardware, you know, in many cases, many of the bankers, for example, had never taken their laptop out of the cradle at work. You know, they, they literally had never taken it out of the building physically, so we didn't know if they had VPN access, any of that kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the span of about a week, they procured, provisioned, and delivered laptops and supporting hardware to everybody in the company. Um, wow. And that was just, I mean, I was floored. I was absolutely floored at how smooth and seamless it was. Zero disruption to our business. Hmm. That was huge, right? And um, as a developer, though, there are a number of additional tools that you need to have installed on your machine. And in many cases that requires administrator permissions or it needs to be rolled out through the software center. And so it still takes days, sometimes weeks for you to get everything set up on your machine before you are able to make a commitment. And quite honestly, um, we, there, again, there are inches to be had there. There are things we can do to improve that story. And, you know, Whatever company you work at, there's there's anybody listening to this likely has scenarios, threads running through their head of like, oh yeah, not not that exact scenario, but we've got this other problem over here that it would be so much smoother for me as a technologist if we had you know people supporting the idea of doing X, doing Y, doing Z. And so in many respects, part of what we do in technology culture is, you know, we we grease the rails, right? We look for ways to improve the 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 you know to improve the tooling, to improve the environment. Um, you know, even just now we started a conversation with with O'Reilly about figuring out how to get Safari subscription for everybody inside uh, technology and possibly the company as a whole. Now, arguably you could say, well, I mean, you know, anybody in a senior leadership position could be able to do that. You're right. But the thing is, you often have things that are important, but not urgent. Right. 
and we frequently there's a tyranny of the of the urgent there's a tyranny of urgency that often occurs kind with about the fires exactly exactly and it just doesn't get done and so in many respects part of the role of technology culture is to look at all of these things i mean we are a support structure no question about it we don't we don't nothing we do ships in the sense that it goes and lives on a server and if it goes down quick and loans can't make money we're not we're not front line we're support structure but in many respects that support structure can be what becomes as the military calls a force multiplier for the people in the field so that if something goes wrong we can you know we can work to correct it and be doing that while they continue to work on what they do and in that sense we make them better uh you we were talking off camera uh we um you mentioned something about mentoring what kind of things are you, is your company initiating with uh, mentoring there's a number of things we're looking at um so all of this is is kind of tbd because the woman who's running that just recently joined my team as a matter of fact ah. she's she's finishing up some performance reviews with her old team as we speak mm -hmm. Uh, before she can join my team full time. So in, in a lot of ways, you know, a lot of it is, um, a lot of it is TBD, uh, but a lot of it is, I think, the same kinds of things that you would really be expecting from any given mentor program. I mean, at the end of the day, fundamentally, it's about finding you a mentor, right? And finding people for you to mentor, because that's bi-directional. A lot of companies will have, for example, as part of their performance, um, as part of their performance uh, uh, profile, right? If you want to be a senior engineer, if you want to be a principal engineer, if you want to be a distinguished engineer, you need to have an impact beyond just the code that you write or the designs that you influence. Right. And so many places have mentoring written right. somewhere in the job description. And that's great. How do you find a mentee? How do you find somebody? Do you just expect them to approach you? Number one. Number two, are the things that the mentee is looking for, are they skills that you actually have, right? That's an important distinction too. Number three, how much time goes into mentoring, right? How much time do we commit to this? There are some places I've been where, yep, I, I mentor my mentee one hour a week. And I have five mentees, so I'm literally putting 10% of my life into doing mentorship. And the company says, that's awesome. That's what we want. Other places, five hours a week out of my 40-hour work week would be disastrous, right? From the company's perspective, oh, no, 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 no. We, we really need you, you know, one hour a week is maximum, which to my mind is kind of tragic. Or they expect you to do the mentoring on your own time which is even more tragic. Right. Um, so that's part of it is working with our partners in the HR group, what we call the Pulse, working with our Pulse partners to say, okay, what, what programs do you have rolling out for the rest of the company and how do we slot our mentorship program into what you're doing? Because we don't want to duplicate their effort. So, for example, Pulse has a lot of programs around how to be a leader, how to be a manager. What does it mean to be? How do you, you know, how do you listen? How do you actively listen? How do you handle crucial conversations? Hmm. All of that kinds of stuff. And those are great programs, but they're not technical in any way, shape, or form. Sure. And so we need to figure out, <clears throat> for example, if I wanted to improve my knowledge of F sharp. Is there somebody in the company who knows F-sharp better than I? And if there is, how do I spend some time with them? How do I find them? And how do we spend some time together? How much time do we spend together? And then on top of that, mentoring relationships, you know, not always, but frequently they turn into a, so what do you want to talk about today? Right? The mentor. Know. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> well, and the other no, thing I, is the mentee is like... The, put, it, put the pressure on the mentee to... And they don't even they don't know what they don't know. They don't even know what questions to ask. Right? right. And so in many cases, the relationship kind of falls apart there right. without any sort of coaching or guidance as to what an effective mentorship relationship looks like. And then on top of that, you just have plain old personality clashes. Right. You know, there are simply people in the world who don't get along because 
you know, they just don't get along. Right? Right. Um, and so all of these are things that the, you know, Stacy, my mentorship program manager, uh, those are all the kinds of things that she's going to be diving into and figuring out, right? Uh, create, creating a program, shopping that around to everybody in technology to make sure that it has momentum, making sure it aligns with the things that are going on inside of the polls. This is, I mean, really, realistically, this is not, uh, if you'll pardon the pun, this is not rocket science. What this is, though, is it's time, it's energy, it's effort, because I'll tell you, the one thing I've learned in my half century on this earth is you can tell what's important to a company by where they put their most precious resource, which is to say the time and energy of their workforce. Microsoft, it's really, really important that they write software. So they have a ton of people writing and supporting that software. Uh, Amazon, it's really important that they figure out their supply chain. So they have a ton of people really focused on that supply chain. The thing that I would challenge to any particular company, you know, whether they're a technology company or not is, you know, where are you putting your time? Where are you putting your energy? Um, lots of companies will say, oh, employees are number one, but then they don't put any time and energy into administering, creating, uh, improving the programs that make their employees better, give their employees better tools, make them more effective, from, you know, literally doing the data analysis to figure out who's getting promoted and why, and how do we improve that? I mean, all of that is stuff that if you really want your people to be the best people, it's not just about hiring the top 1%, it's about growing them into the top 1%. Right. Uh, and by the way, thank you for reminding me that you've been on this planet for half a century and <laughs> happy belated birthday. I hope your birthday last week was as awesome as my 50th birthday, which as you remember, took place in your living room. Yep. Yep, we were having the MVP Summit party at my house, and <laughs> we January. had about 150, 200 some odd guests here. And um, I remember standing there in the foyer as you came in, and you, I said, "How are you doing?" And you're like, "Well, it's been a good day because today's my birthday. I turned 50." And I'm like, "Oh, well, we have to do something with this." And so there was, <laughs> from that moment forward, there was no question in my mind that at some point during that evening. All of us were going to sing happy birthday to you. It was a sing along. I remember it well. <laughs> yeah, it was um, It was fun. It was fun. Hey, before you go, you mentioned diversity and inclusion early on. Are there other things that you're doing to uh, address diversity and inclusion within the organization? So, I, yes. I mean, or you uh, or by you, I mean the collective you, the company. Yeah. I mean, Quicken Loans, uh, we have a chief diversity officer and she is, you know, we are put, we are rolling out um, some OKRs inside the company to, Our, you know, OKRs. OKR objective and key results. Um, this is a, this is a tool that Andy Grove used a lot at Intel. Uh, it's been, it's become more popular. Um, there's a book that came out called Measure What Matters where he talks about how it's used, for example, Google uses it. And fundamentally, I mean, there's nothing magical about what it is, right? The objective, what it is, what is it that we want to accomplish and key results? How do we know that we're actually accomplishing that? It's really, you know, whether you call them key performance indicators, whether you just call it, you know, um, you know, the OODA loop, John Boyd and his observe, orient, decide, act loop. It's a whole bunch of different flavors of this. In the technology space, frequently it's 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 agile, right? We decide on the thing we want to do, and then we have we we look for mechanisms, we create mechanisms that will give us feedback to know whether or not we've accomplished it. Right? So how do you know if your code works? You write unit tests. You can think about KRs as kind of a unit test to figure out whether or not we're actually achieving our objective, but not at the end of the objective. It's these little steps along the way. Right? I see. And so um, the, the the canonical quintessential OKR was when Andy Grove decided that this was 20, 25 years ago, Motorola was getting a little too close to Intel's dominance on the market. And so he unleashed uh, Operation Crush, which was Crush Motorola. And so everybody beneath him had to figure that the objective was to crush Motorola. 
So then everything underneath that, the objective, and then each group underneath created their own objectives that supported that larger objective. And these were the key results to know whether or not we were able to crush Motorola. So the engineers, for example, were looking at, you know, they were rolling out some benchmarks and some engineering improvements in order to ensure that the Intel chips were performing better than Motorola. The marketing department, for example, when they were doing their, their comparison studies, right, their brand recognition studies, Motorola was their principal competitor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so in a lot of ways, the OKR is, you know, it's very similar to what Bill Gates would do with his memos, right? That's your objective. This is what we're going after, right? The famous memo about the internet, Microsoft, we're going to, you know, embed the internet in everything we do. And sure enough, that drove the direction of features for Microsoft Office for many, many years. Um, you know, Satya has done something similar with the memo that he rolled out. Those are your objectives. And then below that, you then say, how do we in fact know whether or not we're accomplishing our objective? It's a way to sanity test. Okay. Hey, we're so, getting just about at the end of the time here. Is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have? <laughs> Dave, I could go on about this for days. I mean, I could go on I could go on for days about just about anything. You know that about me. I do know that. Uh, but um, I mean, realistically speaking, number one, QL is growing. So I've got to put in the obligatory, you know, uh, this is this is a great place to work. I, I, I mean, that's not obligatory. I, I don't mean you're that. not the first person. You are not the first person I've heard say that. Yeah. And truthfully, I'll be really, really. I mean, I'm going to gush here for just a second. Dan Gilbert, the guy who started Quicken Loans. Culture has been an important part of Quicken Loans for all of its 35 years of existence. I mean, frankly, culture, I got to show you this, culture is, is important enough that not only did Dan create a collection of sayings, but they make a book out of it. We call them the isms. <laughs> and Dan this, is, isms. <laughs> this is not a, this, I mean, this is a full color glossy, you know, discussion of all 20 of the isms and what it means. I mean, this is, this is a tremendous amount of energy that is put towards making sure that we understand the concept, right? The culture, one of the isms. <laughs> Every client, every time, no excuses, okay. no exceptions, right? So these are like core values of the company. These are more than core values. This is our culture. These are isms, Okay. right? So in, in if you're a religious person, right, these are your commandments. This is your catechism, right? Mm -hmm. And going back to what I said earlier, you can tell what's important to a company by what they put time and energy behind. There is a whole team that puts these together. We have, I think, twice monthly uh, virtual meetings, and before there were in-person meetings, where our where Dan Gilbert himself would come out on stage, right, hundreds if not thousands of people in the audience, and he would talk about the isms. And we do this twice a month, and this is an all-day meeting. We call it Isms Day, right? That is dedication. That is saying to everybody. This is important. This is important to us. This is important to us as a company. It defines who we are. The thing that I would suggest to anybody who's listening, who has any sort of management capacity whatsoever, what does your time and energy commitment say about what's important to you? I mean, obviously, you can do this at the organizational level. But what is important to you? Where is your company putting your time and energy? Where are you having your team put their time and energy? If training is important to you, you'll make it a part of what your team focuses on. Right. You'll create that that time during the week for them to be able to, uh, you know, go watch a Pluralsight course or go read a, a book or or even just play around with new technology. If innovation is so important, then you'll create time for your team to go right. off and do those innovative things. Um, what, I mean, do the analysis, what does your time and energy say about you as a company, as an individual? And then if you don't like what it says, make the change, decide accordingly. Yep. I mean, make it at least explicit. Don't let it just happen to you. Take more control over your own life. Good advice. Ted, thank you so much for your time and you stay safe. You too, man. You too.
what what the last year has taught us is that technology can help bring friends closer together even from long distances away no question of that but i think we also have this sense that um, technology can make us friends in the whole social media movement um, that I can friend people on Facebook and people that I've never met, people that I've never spent any time with are now my friends. And I think, you know, I, I think we want to really understand the difference between people I've connected to in social media and people I'm genuinely friends with. Um, and I would submit to anybody out there that, you know, friends are people who will come over at two o'clock in the morning because the power is out and, you know, you need something. And, and I will I will give a shout out to Dave Starr because a tree fell in our driveway and Dave drove up 45 minute drive for him with a chainsaw just to carve out to the tree so that, you know, Charlotte and I could get out of the house to go shopping. That's a friend. Right. Friends are the people that you lean on. Technology can help us be better friends, but technology doesn't make us friends.